Hello and welcome to The Classroom Connection, the show that takes you inside Marion County Public Schools. I'm Kevin Christian and over the next 30 minutes we're going to cover everything from dodgeball to new principles. Now I know that's a lot, but the biggest item in today's show is summer school. And now that it is in full swing, of course, it is July. So one popular program puts dozens of kids smack dab in the middle of the Ocala National Forest, all for fun and learning. Of course, it's called Camp Kiwanis and it's a long-standing tradition in our community. If you've never been there, here's Chadwick Pierce to show you exactly what it's like. Ready, set. Every year, Camp Kiwanis is a welcomed retreat to many students here in Marion County, and this year is no exception. We see kids ages 7 through 13, and our maximum capacity is 104 campers each week, 52 boys and 52 girls. And the activities are traditional summer camp activities like swimming and canoeing. You can see the lake back here behind me. Um, archery, arts and crafts, games. And then each evening during the week, we have a different evening activity like battle ball or skit night or dance night. Um, and so uh, the activities generally are outdoor and active. I think arts and crafts is one of the more popular because it's inside and air conditioned. But other than that, the kids are outside running around having fun. The students are running around and having fun and have been for some time now. The Kiwanis Club uh, has had this camp for a long time. It was actually uh, started back in 1949. And it was uh, uh, an old CCC camp and they converted it at that time. And so our club has just uh, adopted it as, one of, uh, as its major project. This major project for the Kiwanis Club had to endure a slight change for its campers this year. This year, we are going back to four weeks instead of five. We were hoping to get five, but because of the economy and things that are going on, it, we're slipping back to about four at 102 students per week for four weeks, 408 plus minus. And of those, about 20% are scholarship students, and those are the ones that we actually uh, fund to uh, allow them to go to the camp. Whether camp is four weeks or five, the students still have fun with their favorite activities. My favorite part is archery because the counselor there, he's always challenging us to do better and he teaches us very well. I think he's a good teacher. Caitlin wants to be a counselor in the future and for good reason. I never want to leave camp because it's so much fun here, but you get a little bit extra things. You get to be here all summer instead of just one week or two weeks. You get to be here every week. So I want to be at camp as much as I can. Counselors at Camp Kiwanis may stay all summer, but it is not all fun and games. They play a very vital role to all the campers. As a counselor, we're basically with the kids 24-7. We take them to all of their activities. We eat dinner with them. We're basically their parents here while they're here at camp. And it's just really fun to like get to know the kids during the week. And you have some kids that you really enjoy and then other kids that, you know, sometimes get on your nerves. But you have to uh, learn to just treat all of them the same and it's really fun. With all that Camp Kiwanis has to offer its campers, there is one activity that seems to affect them all. They like making friends. I think that's a big attraction is meeting new people and having fun. The lake is certainly popular. Um, they also bond pretty tightly with the counselors. Um, so those are probably the three areas I would think that are most popular. Teachers and administrators from our school district are the workers at Camp Kiwanis, and the counselors, well, they are our own local high school students. Now, another part of summer school may not be so fun, but don't tell the kids that. It is third grade reading camp, and while it's action-packed, it is mandatory for students not scoring proficient on this year's FCAT. The director of that camp is Chris Sandy, and she joins us now. Chris is also the executive director of elementary education throughout the district. So Chris, let me first ask you, how many students do we have in mandatory third grade reading? Camp? Our numbers today are about 300. And is that a little more, a little less than what you expected? I would or? say it's about equal. Mm -hmm. uh, our scores this year were about equal to last year, so our need for that camp is still there, but it's about the same level as last year. Now, I say mandatory. Mm -hmm. Yes, it Why is. Why do we have to offer that? By state statute. We, any child that does not deem proficient on FCAT, they must be invited to summer school. It's not mandatory they attend, but okay. they must be invited. 
And by non-proficient, we mean? Any student who scores a level one on FCAT, and if there is space, any student who scores a level two. So parents were, got letters of invite back in May, and it was their choice whether they sent their child or not. Obviously, our hope and intent is for every third grader that's non-proficient to take part in that program. A hundred percent. It is amazing to me, however, those, com those family members that choose not to send those children, but yes, it is our intent to invite every child and have every child intend. It's mandatory. Do we offer transportation? We do, 100 percent. So really, there's no reason not to have your child in third grade reading camp if they're supposed to be there. And let's remember, we also provide breakfast and lunch. Wow. Good so. sakes. With the budget, how are we paying for this? I'm glad you asked. And um, the state has made it quite clear that they provide, that by state statute, that we have the program. So they have provided the dollars oh, for that okay. to be taken care of. And so the salaries for the teachers and the paras and the bus drivers and the buses are paid through through state dollars. Now that begs a question. You mentioned teachers. We're talking about state certified teachers here. We're not they talking are, about just anybody teaching. Exactly. Those are our, our best. Um, we bring those in that have a high level of proficiency and we invite them to work with our most challenged children and it is amazing to me what work they can accomplish in a short amount of time. What's a typical day like in third grade reading camp? It starts at 8 o'clock in the morning and it begins with reading and then we go until 2 o'clock and guess what we're doing when we leave at 2 o'clock? More reading. More reading and we spend the entire time working on all types of reading. We do reading out loud, we do reading together, we do build vocabulary, we work on comprehension, we work on phonics, we work on your fluency. Everything that we know to do to help a child to become that level of proficiency that we expect. And a lot of people may think teaching reading is just sitting down with a book and reading that book or having the child read that book to you. That's the outcome. That's the outcome. That's what you expect. But for some students, they need to learn the nuts and bolts. They did not master phonics like they should have. They did not master the, the vocabulary like they should have. They are not fluent readers. They don't understand what they're reading. And so we work real hard at trying to give those, them the tools that they need to be, reach that level of success. What's the expectation? I mean, these kids aren't going to go from level one to level five over summer. I'm glad you asked. At the end of summer camp, which is a, the middle of July, a student is administered what we call the SAT-10. That's the Stanford Achievement Test, Form yeah. 10. Yeah. And if a student scores at the 45th percentile on that test, then they are deemed proficient and they move on to the next grade. So they don't have to take the FCAT again? No. The third grade reading FCAT? You got it. Okay. So we're talking... Six hours a day for 32, 23 days. 23 days. That's right. That's a about, lot of time in it, the classroom. About 200 hours. Wow. And uh, the expectation is, is that those students will be just pushed over the edge so that they will be successful. And this is obviously not the first year we've done this. No. What kind of results have you seen over the past? Last summer was our highest successful summer. We had 34% of all of our students that took the assessment actually passed on the SAT 10. And you're going to say 34%. She's excited about 34%. Well, it is, means that 34% of the children that took it, 34% of 200, did not get retained in third grade. And that's a huge milestone. That is a huge milestone. That means that they do not have to have that retention in their grade history. So one in every three students. Exactly. Wow. That is very successful as far as I am concerned. We at one time were as low as 10%. So we have done a remarkable job of increasing that level of success for our students. Now, is it too late to get your kid involved if they're supposed to be there? It's almost getting too late, Kevin, um, because the time is ticking. Sure. We take the test on July 21st. But if they believe that they've had a change of heart and want their child to attend, please call the school and we'll take good care of them. Absolutely. Now, we're talking about summer school. Third grade reading camp is not the only thing that's going on with elementary Oh, kids. of course Tell not. Tell me about VPK. VPK. We have about 225 children currently at 10 of our school sites who are actually learning some of the basic pre-kindergarten skills of learning how to know their letter names, know their letter sounds, and even know how to learn how to stand in a line. Wow. I know. And we do it in 10 hours a day. Can you imagine, Kevin? That's a long day. That is a very long day. That's what we're working over the summer. And for adults, the attention span is sometimes you got not it. 10 hours. But our kids are very active the entire day. And it is amazing. When you look at dismissal at 5 o'clock, they still have energy. Our <laughs> teachers are dragging. Yeah. But the kids, oh, they can hardly wait to get home and start playing again. Now, VPK, voluntary pre-K. It's completely pre up to the parent. And pre it's free. Pre Pre-kindergarten. A lot of people think that kids show up on the first day of school ready for kindergarten fully prepared. Maybe, 
but maybe not. And so we want to don't leave it to chance. We want to make sure that we prepare those children with those basic skills that a child should know walking in the door. Let's talk about some of those real quick. All right, let's start with your basic letters of the alphabet. There are 52 letters of the alphabet, uppercase and lowercase. How many of those letters does a child know? Every one of those letters makes a sound. How many of the sounds do those children know? How many of those children are able to count from 1 to 10? How many of those children know their colors? Those are some of the basic skills that a child should know walking in the door, and therefore we spend all summer working on those basic skills. So we take it for granted that kids know their numbers, their letters, their colors. Yes. Manners, well, politeness. Yes, and how to eat in a cafeteria, and how to share, wow. and how to cut with a pair of scissors. Something we all do take for granted. Now, we want the kids to learn in VPK. What do we learn about those kids when they come in? We learn uh, much about their learning style. We learn about their level of achievement. We learn about their socialization skills. We learn how they participate in a group setting. We learn if they need special services. And so we kind of, we just spend the time doing an evaluation of them. And then when school starts, we can share that information with our teachers. It really is win-win for everybody. It's it win -win is. for the child, for the family, for the district, for the classroom, for the teacher, for the student. And amazingly, here's a bit of information. If you attend our VPK program, um, statistically, you will not have to come to summer camp in third grade. Oh. That you will pass right. that FCAT. There you go. That's the reason to do it. That's the reason. Chris, last question for you. How does VPK help a child later on? Later on? We know that you will not be retained in third grade, and some of the more recent information I have read says is that you will be successful your entire K-12 yeah. career. You start off successful, that success It just through. breeds success. Chris, thanks for your time today. It was a pleasure. You're busy, Thank but, you. But summer school, summer is a busy time for all of us. It is. So. Thank you, Kevin. Well, for the most part, it's a sport that is played in elementary school when the weather forces PE classes indoors. But occasionally, middle schoolers play it. But high schoolers and even their teachers? As Joe Hartley shows us, some take it as seriously as Ben Stiller's character in the movie of the same name, Dodgeball. Uniforms? Check. Cheering section? Check. Money up front? Nope. And that's the beauty of Denallon High's Dodgeball Tournament fundraiser. A lot of our fundraisers require us to have money to lay out in order for us to be able to raise funds. And so when this idea was provided to us by our school principal, Ms. Michelle Lewis, um, the concept was there's no money to lay out ahead of time. So we said, sure, we'll give it a shot. Student government took it under their wing this year to try and get it under control and get build um, promotion throughout the student body. Every day in PE for the past couple months we've been playing dodgeball just in school and um, I passed it along to my teacher and um, she's like what and I don't know if it was me giving her the inspiration but she said they had a dodgeball tournament so I thought well you know maybe that's what we've been practicing for or something but we hopped on it right after we heard. Participation was good for the first event drawing about 10 student teams and a demand for a follow-up. As soon as we were done with the tournament they wanted more so with that we promised them another tournament a month later and here we are today um, with about the same number of teams and the kids are loving it. One thing the kids love is a chance to wallop their teachers. This is very serious. On the day of the tournament there's a lot of talking going on throughout school. The students will seek out the teachers that they know they are playing and there's a lot of talking back and forth, a lot of lip mouth going on with the students and so they look forward to getting out here. It's a good time for students and teachers to get together and realize that we are all people relationships and help promote our relationships here at school to further them with their academic achievement. I'll remember that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Think about it. Other than detention, what else is going to get students to hang around for a couple of hours after school on a Friday? The tournament didn't start until 4.30. Um, school got out at 3.30, so they had to hang around for an hour after school. Um, and then they're going to be here until probably about 5.30, almost 6 o'clock on a Friday evening. So it's a safe place for students to be and have a good time with their peers. It's a lot of fun. It's some. Um... You know, it's a lot of, it's one of the only uh, school activities I've taken part in this year, but it's, I, I love it, it's fun. While the tournament doesn't require any money up front, everything's already there, they did spend a little on rewards for the top teams. The only thing that is purchased, and this was only because we felt that the students needed some kind of recognition, each of the teams that placed today in first, second, or third place will be awarded a um, medal, gold, silver, and bronze, according to their appropriate placing. 
pride goes a long way too. Last time, uh, the team that we beat for in the finals, actually we were talking a lot of smack. and. Um, so uh, it felt good being able to get my revenge. With the obvious popularity of the event, DHS plans to expand it next year. We're looking forward to making this get even bigger and hopefully at some point in time being able to incorporate students from other area schools. Until then, they'll keep it local, but still expand. Our hope is that next year we can do one each grading quarter and it'll allow each of the classes at Denellen High School, each of the graduating classes to provide one um, tournament each quarter so that each one of them has a chance to earn funds. And if they'll allow recent graduates, they can count on at least one entry. Heck yeah, because I'll come out every time and I'll, my team will bring my $5 and, you know, and I'm sure Rossi will be back next time to try to get his medal back. At Maplewood Elementary, dodgeball is a reward with honor roll students taking on school administrators. Well, speaking of Maplewood, former assistant principal Ryan Bennett is one of five new principals this fall. But unlike the other four, he has no prior experience either as a new principal or with his new school, which led to a hectic few days at the end of June. Joe Hartley followed him around on his whirlwind tour. Meetings, trainings, wrapping up one job, starting another, cleaning out his office. Not much of a summer vacation for new Anthony principal Ryan Bennett. It was a little stressful for, you know, at first, um, you know, just I think juggling both of it. I had a fifth grade graduation here. I went to the fifth grade graduation at Anthony also um, and ended up being the guest speaker for the night, which was kind of, you know, oh, by the way, you're going to you're going to be the guest speaker. So, you know, it was a little bit, you know, I, I was wearing two hats, um, obviously, you know, I went and met their faculty. So all of this I'm doing as I'm also the assistant principal of Maplewood. I've been to a lot of meetings over the past couple of weeks. I had a um, elementary small group principals meeting um, that I attended. Two days before that, I went to my last AP meeting. You know, it's been a lot of extra emails and extra meetings and, and extra, you know, just tying up, really tying up loose ends at both schools because I, I've done some stuff with Anthony moving forward for next school year while I was doing stuff to end the school year at Maplewood. Having spent five years at Maplewood, it was hard to part ways. So much so, the staff asked him to clean out his office over the weekend so they wouldn't have to see him leave. His boss for the last two years has given him some advice on his new position. You have to be that, that face of the school. You have to be visible uh, within the classrooms, in the hallways, in the cafeteria, but also in the car rider line at events and things like that. And to be able to, to have a, uh, a rapport with parents and community and students that is very open so you can effectively have that leadership. I think the most important thing that, you know, that she's offered is just I'm only a phone call away you know if if, if you have a question about something if you're not sure um, you know pick up the phone give me a call been there done that after loading the boxes in his truck it was time to leave his position as assistant principal at Maplewood and head to his new job as principal at Anthony Elementary and the accompanying prime parking space before even unloading his truck, Bennett got a tour of his new campus from retiring principal Jerome Brown. You have a uh, primary lab technology up there. It was nice to kind of get, you know, familiar with where the, you know, intermediate wing is, where the primary wing is, you know, look into some classrooms, check out the computer lab, um, and just, you know, kind of get the, kind of get his perspective of, you know, where things are, and so it was, um, very interesting and a very short tour. Um, I'm used to a very big campus at Maplewood and this was a nice five minute stroll. <laughs> After seeing the classrooms, Bennett sat down with Brown, the assistant principal and school secretary to discuss which teachers would be in those classrooms this fall. So what are you saying, Mrs. Gary? She's saying move Guiden to third. No, no, no. no. Um, if you flip flop Guiden and Jared. It was very helpful to uh, sit down and you know, go over the unit allocation, which is what we were, you know, talking about as far as, you know, um, some teacher moves, some, you know, some teachers retiring and, and things like that. And it was, it was nice to get, you know, Mr. Brown's opinion and, and, and to see where he felt like some people should be moved and, um, 
just to get that information from him because he knows those teachers a lot better than I know them because they're all new to me. I was concerned that before I left that he knew exactly what his unit allocations were, who the people were, what their strengths were, and their areas are not so much as a strength. I don't know a good word other than to say that was their negatives. We went over uh, from pre-K down to uh, fifth grade ESE units and what have you, told them who was there, what their different strengths were, and how they could help, and made suggestions to him about changes. And But I was really concerned that before I left that he had all of his teachers in place. Every place would have a plug in it. Leaving behind suggestions about staff can be helpful. Leaving behind a good secretary can be a lifesaver. They are the ones that uh, can make or break you in a sense because they're here. When you get her in the morning, probably when you leave in the afternoon, they will probably hear. I don't know what I would have done many times with things that I didn't know about. Mm -hmm. I had to go to her and ask, and if she didn't have the answer, she'd track it down, and then track me down and get me the answer. She's gonna be my right-hand person. She's gonna be my go-to. She's gonna you know, help me with the questions I don't have the answers to, and um, you know, I think she's, you know, just like I think he mentioned, you know, she's gonna be that, that rock that kinda you know, helps you when you don't know what you're doing and, 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 and gives you those answers, or you know, lead you in the right direction or calls you when you when something needs to happen and uh, you know she's she's gonna be a very 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 important person. Um, can she carry boxes? Because her new boss has a lot of stuff to move into his new office. Other changes among principals this fall include Rusty Corley taking over at East Marion, replacing Mike Hearn who moves to Fort McCoy School, who replaces Rob Hensel who moves to Howard Middle School, to replace Kathy Collins, who is now retired. And finally, at Wyomino Park Elementary in Ocala, Mike Graff is calling it a career after 42 years with the school district. So his assistant, Melissa Kynard, takes the helm there. Lots of moves, lots of luck to them. Well, our TV production students here in Marion County have their act together, capturing regional, state, national, even international awards every year. And right now, we want to share a Best of Show winner from this year's Marion County Student Media Festival. This video comes to us from the students in Beth Woods' video production classes at Danella Middle School. Take a look. Welcome to the Wild Campus. Today we'll be observing the mating habits of adolescent homo sapiens, the Tinas Americanus. On the Wild Campus, traditional public displays of affections have been banned. These public displays are kissing, hugging, no, and anything that appears to touch your feelings. Therefore, the adolescents of the species have had to adapt to their mating rituals. Come along with us on this phenomenal safari across the wild campus. Listen. That's the mating call of the male Tinus Americanus. <laughs> it looks like we might be getting close. If we're quiet, we might be able to observe the natural mating. The male approaches a female species. But wait, there's another love struck male. Watch as these male Tinus Americana show off for the female. It's springtime and the hormones are at their peak. <laughs> Holy blonkers, they're going bonkers. This mating ritual is turning into a melee. Oh my gosh, it looks like we're about to witness a rare mating dance-off between the two males. The male of the species is more colorful than the female, and they're about to show off their tremendous swag. Now look, he's ruffling his colorful feathers. It looks like he caught the female's attention.
If you have children in the room, you may want to get them out, for what you're about to see is very graphic. I think they're about to mate. Oh my gosh, did you just see what happened? For the first time on the WOW campus, two adolescents have finally consummated their relationship with an approved public display of affection. Hallelujah! We finally caught her on tape, this extraordinary event. Now the male leaves to boast to his buddies. Join us next time for another exciting episode on the Wild Campus. Next month, you'll see the Best of Show High School video, and I assure you it is one everyone will enjoy. Well, speaking of joy, each month we feature right here someone who really gets into their job because they love what they do in this school district. This month we want you to meet Terry Jennings, the lady responsible for feeding nearly 800 students at Hammett Bowen Elementary. some fruit? Okay, get some fruit. You want some fruit? Want some fruit? How about some carrots? How about peaches? No fruit? Carrots or fruit? Go get one. You want some peaches? I take what I've learned and I try to put it all into one and as my kids come through the line I try to let them know this is a safe place to come you know we're going to teach you about a lot of different things we're going to try to help you learn the ways to eat and stuff but if you need somebody to talk to or if you need some help adjusting your clothes, tying your shoes, washing your face. We're here to help do all that also. I try to teach these children that just because I'm not your mom, I'm still here, still here to help you. I try to teach and show these kids that I may not be every day with you, but my ladies that I have working for me, no matter if it's summer school, no matter if it's my base school, that we're all here to help you and treat you, you know, the way we would want our children to be treated. Yes, come on. You want some care? I want my children to be treated special and be cared about and be loved, and that's the way I want to treat everybody else's children too. So I love my job. I really like working with the kids, but I like the staff and stuff also. But the kids is what makes it. You learn so much from the kids and they learn so much from us. I really like my job. Now, if you know someone who loves their job in our school district, consider emailing their name to us at classroomconnection at marion.k12. Dot fl dot us. Again, you'll see the address there on your screen, Classroom Connection at marion.k12.fl.us. Who knows, maybe your idea will be next month's lead story. Well, Superintendent Jim Yancey shares important information with us every month at this point in our show, and this month is no exception. Here he is in this month's Superintendent Spotlight. Hi, and welcome back in the middle of your summer vacation. Uh, we hope everybody had a great time in June and we're looking forward to July and getting ready for the school year to start on August 22nd for students. So parents, if you will, continue to have your students read or if they haven't started reading, please uh, take this opportunity to go to Florida Department of Education online, find some books that are appropriate uh, for your child. They're, they're listed by grade level and there's certainly some great recommendations there or you can uh, possibly call the school and they may have their own reading list that they want your child to read. So we hope you'll follow through with that. Hope everybody's having a great year, great summer, and when we get back in the fall, there'll be a few changes because of budget constraints and that kind of thing, but nothing that we can't overcome, and we're trying to minimize the impact inside the classroom. So we're looking forward to next year and preparing for your child to have another great school year here in Marion County Public Schools. Thanks, and have a great summer. Thanks, Mr. Yancey, and thank you for joining us today. I hope to see you again right here for another episode of The Classroom Connection. But until then, parents, remember, be there for your child every day.